Rebonjour à tout le monde. Euh, merci euh, merci d'être venu. Euh, nous sommes très heureux d'accueillir aujourd'hui euh, l'une des meilleures ambassadrices euh, du Mescal. Euh, on est, on est d'ailleurs, et on a deux d'ailleurs, l'égérie du Mescal en France, euh, Karina Soto. Et, euh, euh, et la deuxième, c'est notre invitée d'aujourd'hui, euh, Niki Nakasawa. <rire> Alors, euh, Niki a, a fondé euh, récemment euh, Neta Mescal, euh, qui est devenu euh, rapidement un des mescales des, euh, des, des références dans le monde. Euh, et elle s'est installée, elle a beaucoup voyagé, s'est installée au Mexique. Euh, et, euh, et donc, euh, elle a évolué dans les domaines de, de la gastronomie, du design, de la musique. Et elle a été fixeuse et... Euh, euh, pour des différents documentaires, notamment Ugly Delicious, comme David Chang. Euh, et elle a fondé aussi le pop-up, un concept gastronomique Pichon, le pop-up Pichon. Et, et elle est là responsable d'avoir aussi euh, propulsé le mescal à, 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 au niveau supérieur, au moment où euh, elle a sensibilisé euh, René Redzepi euh, sur les qualités du mescal. Et donc, euh, son mescal a été raffoncé. Euh, au pop-up euh, des Noma au Mexique. Et donc, euh, euh, je suis très heureux de vous présenter euh, celle qu'on connaît comme euh, The Queen of Mescal, ah. Niki Nagasawa. <rires> Merci. Merci, Domingo. Vous avez le Yeah, Oui, je suis assis parce que je pense que nous devrions être juste être et avoir une conversation au lieu de me kind of just telling you so much. Uh, but really, thank you so much to the Mezcal brothers, thanks to Viva Agave, to everybody involved. It's like really uh, such a huge pleasure to be here and uh, I'm really grateful uh, that you all are willing to come and to listen to what I have to say. Um, so yeah, this is uh, our project, Neta. Um, Neta, we began, um, I'm trying to figure out, oh, you. Let's yes. move the slides. <laughs> okay, so um, NETA uh, is a kind of like a love project that's formed in 2012. Um, my business partner and really dear friend, Max um, Rosenstock, he's driving around Oaxaca and has the incredible fortune of coming across this tiny community called Logoche in Miwatlan. Um, so Miwatlan, Uh, we can move on. Uh, so Miwatlan is in Oaxaca, um, and uh, we're at kind of the southern, one of the southernmost parts of the state, um, and it's uh, an area that is right at the foothills of the Sierra Madre del Sur. So this is a 1,000-kilometer mountain range that starts um, in Michoacán, and runs all the way down to, uh, to the Isthmus of Tehuantepec. Um, so it's a very special region, and one of the reasons why we're working there is because of the incredible diversity that it has. Um, so, you know, why Oaxaca? Oaxaca is the most uh, biodiverse state in Mexico. Um, because of this incredible mountain region, we have uh, like an insane amount of biodiversity, but not only um, biodiversity at the level of like plants, but uh, ethno-cultural diversity. So um, Oaxaca is also home to 16 different linguistic groups, um, 16 producing regions, um, and uh, eight geographic regions. So um, it's a fairly impressive amount of diversity that we're working with. And uh, part of our project um, as NETA has really been trying to bring light to the diversity of the different producing regions, not only in all of Mexico, but really in Oaxaca, that we're not just talking about, you know, Oaxaca and mezcal or mezcal as this kind of gen generic category, but um, as something that um, has the same level of specificity um, and uh, terroir as wine. So, um, Yeah, so Miwatlan. Here we are, the southern part of the state. If you're right here, um, right here we're touching the base of uh, the Sierra Madre del Sur. And so we're, the area that I work is between 1,600 and 2,200 meters above sea level. 
And so as you're going from uh, the base of the, the parcels where um, I'm working, and then you go up into the mountains, it's maybe a three day walk from uh, this town and uh, like an hour drive. And so you're getting into these incredibly beautiful uh, oak and pine forests that are all under clouds. And uh, this is the more indigenous region. We're in a Zapotec area, and there's maybe 20 different dialects of Z Zapotec spoken um, in the area. And uh, it's because of this extreme geography. So from one mountain, from one side of the mountain to the other side of the mountain, you can have completely different words for a word as common as you know, cat or dog. Um, so uh, just with keeping this in mind, thinking about this type of extreme geography, we can all understand how the, the plants that we're working with and also um, the conditions of production are quite, uh, are conditioned by all of these factors, by this geography, which is extreme, by these long distances, by uh, the irregularity of, of, um, of the land. So here's just kind of a, an example of the landscape that, I'm, that we're working in. Um, there's a tepestate right there. There's some biquiche right here. There's a field of some espadín and madrequiche. Um, and, uh, and so one of the, you know, getting to <laughs> this concept of tequio. So um, for me, it's really important when we're talking about neta and about mezcal in general to, again, consider like the geographic uh, things that are affecting how we're, pr uh, we're producing, but also the cultural ones. So in this area, um, uh, the community all participates in a form of trade called tequio. And so this is a communal form of labor where every member of the community is uh, responsible for participating in uh, communal works. So um, if there is a bridge that needs to be built, if there is um, a church that needs to be built or any type of like communal project, each member of the community has the responsibility of uh, gifting their time. Um, so in mezcal production, uh, we have a slightly different prisma because we are working within um, the conditions of communal labor just within the, the community of Logoche, which is a community of 104 people. Um, but with mezcal production, then we are also dealing with the, the structures of kinship. And so the communities um, is made, well, the community uh, is con constructed by three main families, and they're founded at the turn of the century, right after the, Mex the Mexican Revolution in the 1920s, 1930s. Um, the Vasquez, the Anquino, and the Garcias. And so these three families, in addition to participating in the, the communal works, um, also participate along their kinship lines in communal labor in the production of mezcal. Um, I think we can go to the next slide. <laughs> So um, something that's uh, super in interesting in, the, in the, the community that we work in as well um, is uh, the way that we cultivate. So I think that there's maybe this false dichotomy or this false discussion around mezcal of wild and cultivated varietals of uh, agave. And um, in Logoche and in Mihuatlan, uh, not everywhere, but where, where I think Erika from Mezcaloteca over here and, uh, and I uh, work. Um, we're always working in polyculture. And uh, I think that there's this strange kind of like idea that somehow a cultivated agave is less than uh, a wild one. So we have this fetishization of like the wild agave and you know, it's found in the mountain, but really like uh, agriculture or cultivation, this is care. So it requires true custodians of the land. So um, we're, we're talking about an area that uh, um, is actually pri privately owned lands, and they're lands that were acquired over um, several generations. And so an average uh, producer that I work with will have about 15 to 20 hectares of land divided up in three or four small parcels. And in those parcels, uh, they're uh, planting um, maybe some uh, rows of agave, usually a mix between uh, different species of Karwinskis um, and espadín. And then they're also planting corn, beans, and squash. And so uh, 
there's a, there's a natural relationship between all these plants. Um, and we could call it a kind of permaculture, but uh, in this area it's called the milpa system, which is a very, very ancient system of, uh, of cultivation, but it's also very smart and contemporary. So um, they're growing, again, uh, at the beginning of the, the rainy season. We have only two seasons, dry and wet. <laughs> at the beginning of the rainy season is when they start to their plant their, uh, their corn alongside the agaves. And so as the corn grows, um, it helps maintain the moisture in the land for, for the agaves. Um, and uh, the agaves act as kind of natural protectors from the animals because this is a community that al also uh, takes care of a lot of livestock. So the cows are grazing, the chickens are grazing, the goats are grazing, and they're not gonna eat your corn because you have these big spiky friends who are gonna <laughs> protect them. Um, uh, then uh, something that's amazing about the root structure of the agaves is that they start to break up the minerals um, in the, this very rocky soil, making them available for the corn. And then uh, we have um, the beans that are grown after uh, the, the corn starts to come up and they start to fix the nitrogen in the soil and also grow up the stalks of the, the corn. And then you have the squash that grow at the bottom, um, which then as they die are returning to the earth. So it's a, it's a very intelligent system that, that uh, again, when we think about cultivated, this is how we cultivate. And that is uh, the beauty and the care involved in, uh, in cultivated species. Um, and uh, um, in a way, in the 1990s, Excuse me. Yeah, the um, cultivated agaves, like agaves like espadín, um, madre cuiche, these are species that um, I think that now everyone's like, oh, it's just espadín, you know? But that th these were really luxurious species. These were, they were, these were things that um, uh, espadín or madre cuiche, these are species that are actually quite high in sugar. And so they require more care and pest control. Um, so I just think it's, uh, it's important to start maybe opening our minds or thinking a little bit differently about uh, mezcal in the context of cultivation, especially in, uh, in subsistence farming communities where um, it, we don't plant in like huge kind of fields of just one species. There's no monoculture here. Uh, so, uh, Madre Cuiche, this is actually a field of espadín, but I just wanted you to see um, the, the way that the flowering stalks come up. Um, not all agaves have this type of uh, shape of the, the stalk, but um, what's amazing is that species of agave have co-evolved with species of bats. So we have about 138 species of bats in Mexico and about 158 species of agave. And so the, the two species kind of grew up together and over thousands of years have co-evolved. And the reason why we have this height of the, the quiote or the flowering stalk is so that the bats can come and drink the nectar. Can go, so thanks bats. Uh, <laughs> but but uh, yeah, the bats are really uh, like an incredible, incredible pollinator. Uh, they, um, they're flying all night, huge distances to, to drink um, the nectar. So they have these long serrated tongues to get inside the flower. But then what happens is that their faces become covered with pollen. And so they go kissing all the different uh, flowers and they pollinate with their bodies and their face actually. So, um, and then like at the end of the night, they like, you know, lick the, the pollen off their face and the pollen is actually 50% protein. So it gives them a lot of uh, power to fly through the night. Um, but uh, the Madre Cuiche, which is one of the agaves and one of the mezcals that um, is gonna, available now through Mezcal Brothers, um, is an incredible uh, plant and called Madre Cuiche, the Mother Cuiche, because she has this tremendous genetic potential and she was bred actually for this potential. So through all this cross-pollinization and these different seed pods, you can have up to five different species. 
So this is a really crazy thing, and this is something that like is amazing about the, the diversity, the biodiversity of the area, that only through this kind of biodiversity that can you have so many different species. So for example, Cuiche Verde, this is a, one of the hybrid species that is born of Madre Cuiche, but it's actually sterile. So she can't have children. <laughs> um, she might have some hijuelos, so some uh, rhizomal clones, but um, it's actually a sterile thing that only happens um, through cross-pollinization. So when you can drink uh, Cuiche Verde, it's like, you're, it's incredible. It's an incredible like, uh, blessing and opportunity because you're drinking something that is just uh, like a weird phenotype that appeared out of you know, bats making out. So then Tobasiche is also uh, another type of hybrid species. Um, Tobasiche can go to seed, but it, she's also born of uh, Madre Cuiche. Um, so Bi Cuiche, which is what you all have in your glasses. Um, Bi Cuiche is a sister, brother, cousin, we don't know how, but there is of uh, Madre Cuiche. And this is a more wild uh, species. Bequisha was used frequently as um, natural fencing and as ways to kind of divide parcels of land and also reproduces um, quite fervently through uh, the rhizomatic clones, through its root structure. So um, it has a lot less sugar content than the Madre Quiche. And so we have this kind of like interesting, almost ocean notes. I don't know what you guys think, but the, <laughs> that's the Bequisha. Um, Bequisha is interesting because it, it's, it, has, it shares the genetic kind of information of Madre Quiche, but it was kind of like more of a, a species that was left a bit wild, and again for this uh, natural fen fencing. Um, Madre Quiche was considered really a luxurious um, plant, and something that started being uh, planted more in mass in the 1990s after the, after the establishment of the, the denomination of origin, um, which permits the, these very rural areas to have um, access to government subsidies for uh, building their palenques and for um, germinating agaves. So this is Celso. <laughs> Celso made the Bequiche. And uh, he is the head of one of these great families that I'm telling you about, the Garcias. And Celso, um, he was in the army from 1980 to 1989. And upon his return to uh, Miwatlan, to his community, decided that he was going to really focus his energy on doing something positive because he was up working in the northern territories in five northern states, burning fields but marijuana fields, this is kind of like the beginning of the war on drugs um, in Mexico. Uh, we have some uh, money coming in from uh, the states um, to really crack down on, uh, on weed farmers. Um, during the 1980s in this area, um, they're growing, there's like a 10 year period where everybody is growing marijuana. But there was no, uh, people weren't concerned. Everybody was fighting the, uh, the war on drugs in the north of Mexico. And so Oaxaca was kind of left out of the, the situation. People were still uh, making mezcal, but it was kind of a symbolic, com almost like a community um, service because mezcal was being paid at like five pesos a liter. Like it was worthless. So how did you make cash? You, this was the cash crop, weed. And, the, and then um, a lot of the, the mezcaleros that we work with, they were either involved in growing marijuana or in uh, smuggling uh, bricks to the border. So the, the mezcal, as we're drinking it today, this is actually something very new. Um, in the, so anyways, uh, Celso is really like somebody who got people involved in, uh, in better forms of distillation. Um, there's some organizations in the, uh, starting to form in Miwatlan in the 1980s for uh, germinating agaves and for strengthening um, community, uh, com uh, communities of mezcaleros and making it actually something that you could make a living off of. We can go, so yeah. Improving distillation techniques. So again, the DO is established in 1994. So we have um, some organizations 
that start to believe in the, the power of mezcal and the ability of this to actually be something in rural uh, Oaxaca and in Miwatlan um, that people can live off of. So there's this huge push um, from some local po politicians, including this guy, uh, Roman Garcia Robles, who uh, founds a uh, NGO, well, like a uh, rural association called Agaves del Sur. And he gets a bunch of money from the government to start building palenques. So today in the community, they have 16 palenques. Um, none of this would have been possible without the DO, but I currently do not work within the denomination. Um, it's a, another story and a long one, so we won't get into it now, but uh, we can uh, kind of move on. Um, uh, another kind of interesting fact about the, the community is um, kind of like thinking about the 1990s as this boom in, in uh, the establishment of palenques in distillation techniques. We have people coming from Jalisco. We have the producers going to Jalisco to learn about uh, distillation. Um, double distillation starts to be something that people actually do. Before it was continuous distillation, people were going blind. Uh, <laughs> from bad mezcal. A lot of the, the producers that I work with are actually sober today because they drank so much back in the day. Um, so we generally are kind of thinking about mezcal maybe as this like unbroken ancestral beverage from pre-Hispanic times, which is just not true. Um, there's this new chapter, especially where I work, that really begins in the 1980s and 1990s. Um, Jabalin, for example, um, is a really uh, interesting case because this was a species that was uh, cultivated for its use in fiber. So uh, there's kind of some haciendas in the 1930s, uh, well, in the, earlier than that, before the Mexican Revolution, people are uh, growing javelin for fiber. In other parts of Mexico, it would have been henequen. And there's, uh, it's very important for making types of ropes. Yes. Is that, is that the same plant or is it a different plant? Javelin? Yes, javelin and henequen. They're different plants, they're the same uh, species or a related species. I think that henequen is like a curvoci and then this is a convalis. Okay. Uh, so um, it's a subgenus of agave um, called Letea. And uh, as you know, a lot of mezcal lovers here may know, um, the convalis uh, or the subspecies has tons of steroids, natural steroids. Um, one of them is um, a chemical called saponin. So saponins create this, it's for natural soap making. So you have this crazy, crazy foam. So it's really not ideal for mezcal production, but it has quite a lot of sugar. Um, so again, um, in this case, it's a plant that was, uh, that was cultivated for fiber, for making ropes. There's uh, a type of rope locally called a javalina. Um, and uh, Erica po pointed out to me the other day that um, in the Mixteca, it's called rabiosa or rabioso because uh, rabioso is like a foaming at the mouth, almost like rabies. So uh, <laughs> when, you're, when you're cutting this, um, they, I've been told that the piñas are so slippery that they fall out of your hands. Um, and then when you, uh, when you ferment it, it's like a very kind of like foamy, difficult fermentation. And the distillation has to be done at a much lower temperature. Um, the first distillation still looks kind of like a green foam. Um, so it's just a very tricky uh, agave to use. But, um, the, the production of Jabalin that we have through Mezcal Brothers and available here, it's a production of 80 liters, um, and it's from 2015. And it was the first time that Candido Cruz, um, Celso's brother, had actually used this agave. Um, so Jabalin in Miwatlan, is, this is new. You know, it's not like everybody was always making javelin and this ancient tradition is like, no, you know, this it had a different purpose and you can still actually cut the leaves, use it for, um, for rope or for fiber, for whatever, and then use the piña and make mezcal. Um, but uh, there's really a lot of um, innovation happening constantly in uh, the mezcal communities and especially in this 
community. Uh, I think that in the past seven years that I've been uh, buying mezcal and working with the, these mezcaleros, there's been uh, like what we call mezcal trends. In <laughs> Like that uh, Max, my business partner, will sometimes make, make a little suggestion and then suddenly, you know, everyone's like, oh yeah, that sounds, you know, maybe that's a good idea. And so now we're actually also producing a cucharilla, which is a sotol. So there are plants that are everywhere, but nobody had ever distilled with them. So people are starting to make cucharilla, people are starting to work with javalin. Uh, now they're doing some experiments with the base of the leaves, which have quite a lot of uh, sugar. Um, and they're doing these tiny little productions. They're, they're experimenting with uh, um, different forms of distillation, how slow, how much fire. So, you know, we're always, um, Mezcal and I think Neta, we're, we're really a project that's, uh, on the one hand, we're working with fourth or fifth generation Mezcal producers on both sides of the family, you know. Uh, I'm talking about a lot of uh, the male producers, but the women in the family also make the mezcal with, with their husbands um, and with their kids. Um, but, you know, every time I go, they're trying something new. And uh, that's just important to remember. Um, and neta, so you all guys know, if you're not familiar with Mexican slang or Mexican Spanish, neta means the real deal. Um, it can also be used as a verb. So, uh, as you drink, and as we continue to drink a little more mezcal throughout the night, we get uh, since we become more sincere. So the idea of neta and of neteando is to achieve that sincerity or to get to that point of the night where you're just telling each other the truth. So I hope to, uh, yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> you learned something. <laughs> Do you any, guys questions? Have any questions? Uh, there's your a question over there. Is, is the cell in what? The, your mezcal is cell in yeah, yeah. So through uh, Mezcal Brothers, um, uh, it's, we just brought the first palette. This is my first importation. So um, we have the Madre Quiche, the Biquiche, and the Javalin. So you just tried the Biquiche, but there's two others, and yeah. Any other questions, comments? So you say all this innovation that is happening right now is definitely in coherence with the boom of the mezcal in the past 10 years, I say so. Uh -huh. All these new brands coming, all this, uh, I imagine. Yeah. Is that also to preserve the future of mezcal? Because the future of mezcal can look very uncertain when you think about the species and yeah. the families and also the culture of money coming in. And yeah, is, yeah. It's all linked to that? I think it's all linked to that. I mean, I think that really, like, um, uh, something I didn't mention was uh, Logoche, or the community that I am. There was no paved roads until the end of the 1980s. So everything was, and there was a period, a long period of a kind of prohibition era. It wasn't really prohibited but um, by law, but if you weren't paying the tax, then the fiscales or the fiscal agents could come and they would uh, break your stills. Um, so there's always this been a battle um, in very rural Mexico for access in general, but access to cash, access to political um, power. And the further you are, because uh, Mexico is like a centralist com country and a centralist government, the further you are from Mexico City, the further you are from the source of power. Um, so there's like, uh, in uh, the community I work in, um, it's uh, a part of the, um, an indigenous municipality which works under usos y costumbres. Um, so it's indigenous law. And um, it's just very difficult to, yeah, to access cash. So the boom of mezcal, I think, is now obviously having an impact on how people organize. And... Um, on the one hand, we have these traditional forms of organization like techio, um, which are one filter or one way in which people organize themselves and it really is efficient. But then as you get cash in, obviously, now we're seeing a transformation of those systems of trade into a cash economy. 
So there's a lot of things we don't know what the future of Mescal is going to look like, but obviously um, with some more cash coming in, with some more access in general, maybe uh, there's, there's a interest in, um, in germination, in uh, better uh, agricultural practices, in better distillation things. So it comes with both, you know? It's a double-edged sword, so on the one hand, you can maybe buy like way more. We, I, you see the impact of things like Coca-Cola, um, and uh, one of the, the producers that we work with, she got her first refrigerator in 2015. So the first car in the community is 2005. 2015, the first refrigerator, the first tiendita with a refrigerator maybe in 2010. And then Coca-Cola, Coca-Cola, everybody has diabetes in like five years, you know? It's crazy. So, you know, there's a lot of things. We're in a period of rapid change. Um, and uh, I think we're, there's a lot of different lenses, a lot of different things that are affecting how money is going to impact the community. So we just don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, some other questions? Uh, I have a question. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. But um, <clears throat> in the meanwhile, uh, can you explain us why you're not working with the DO and the difference between mezcal uh, and uh, uh, agave distillates? Yeah, sure. So um, one of the reasons why I'm not working with the denomination is actually just a practical reason. Um, despite the influence or the importance of um, Comarcan or the CRM in um, actually establishing a lot of the palenques in this community, there was a break with Agaves del Sur. So this organization that I mentioned that helped bring all this money into the community, there was a, there was a big problem where um, as a part of, to become a member of this cooperative, you had to uh, pay an entrance fee of like 80 liters of mezcal. And then um, a lot of people got ripped off. And there was this, there, there was this kind of like break with the CRM, um, a break with uh, forms of collective uh, organization and people started, instead of working within the cooperative system, started working uh, individually. So when you break with the cooperative system, it's much more difficult to organize um, the logistics of being a part of, a, of um, uh, the system. So I, where we work, we have no cell phone signal. Um, we have uh, no internet. So it's really hard to get people to like fill out forms, to do things. There's also very low levels of literacy. Now it's gotten a lot better, but um, you know, the, the abuelos in the community, the, the elders in the community, a lot of them don't know how to read or write. Um, so there's a lot of barriers to access. Um, and so uh, the difference between destilado y agave and, and, um, and mezcal, uh, there's obviously just the difference that happens on paper, but in reality, you know, what you're trying, what we're drinking is mezcal. Um, I think that... It's a mere legal difference. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a legal difference. Um, and we try to work at a small enough scale that we can be transparent. But yeah, yeah. yeah just to make a case, like if you are in champagne and you produce champagne, but actually you can't call it champagne because you don't pay the fee. Yeah. Okay. Right. Then when you you are through the CRM, you you make sure technically that you mm -hmm. use lies then and it's not like uh, painful for your health. It's mm -hmm. like healthy, but I'm sure she makes the things. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. We do. Everything is Right. Yeah, we do all of our, uh, we, uh, the, it's exactly the same, like in terms of uh, the, uh, the chemical, the, like the lab um, tests that we do, we do exactly the same tests as, uh, and we uh, abide by those um, chemical rules or whatever, yeah. with the levels of methanol and for, for all, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, question? Uh, does, does that create some extra challenges for you to export the product to other markets? Uh, it, uh, you know, I just started, and it makes it easier. Actually, the because um, I only I abide by the NOM um, 070, which is um, the regula regulatory framework for um, distillates of agave and for other distillates. So you know, it's just with the with the mezcal denomination, it would mean that I would have to have like verifiers come and verify like almost every single. Process and again because I work with um, I work with like maybe 16 separate palenques. You can imagine like 
each palenque has to pay like 30,000 pesos a year. Each palenque would have to have every aspect of their process certified. Um, so it becomes extremely expensive when your production is only 1,000 liters a year. I mean, where the, the, the bottle, pr the productions that uh, we have in France right now, it's like I have 390 bottles of Madre Quiche, 246 bottles of Biquiche, 84 bottles of Javelin. Like it's nothing, you know, for me to go through the whole certification process for those, for each batch, for each Palenque, it's very difficult. And, um, you know, we're a tiny company, so this is why. Huh? We bottle everything actually at the Mezcaloteca facility. So Mezcaloteca, they have a, a there's a ranch that's uh, 20 minutes from uh, Logoche. It's uh, called Mengoli, and so we're actually bringing the mezcal there. We're in the process of um, getting the a facility kind of oper operational in the community. It's actually the infrastructure is there, but we have this big problem because it's sort of it's under the name of the cooperative, and now that the cooperative is like separating into all these individuals, um, we have to do all this paperwork, so. Uh, can you tell us which is the social impact of uh, La Neta uh, Mezcali in the local communities? Uh, sure, so um, as I was mentioning at the beginning, I work in one community, like two, three, community, uh, three communities in reality, but like are the main core of uh, Neta is Logoche. It's 104 people. We all know each other. Like, and um, you know, the impact is obviously uh, a matter of bringing some cash in, uh, creating some uh, economic opportunities that uh, allow the next generation to stay in the community. There's a lot of uh, internal migration of people from the community to Los Cabos to work in hotels or to the states. Um, uh, we have a long, long, many, many years of a very negative uh, migration patterns that affect communities. So um, when you start creating jobs or economic opportunities, then obviously it means that people can stay and work their land. And so our hope is that, you know, you know obviously people can choose whatever they want, but if you have, if you own your land, you have the means to use it and you have the opportunity to use your knowledge to make money, then that's great. Right. Excellent. Another question? How difficult has it been for you to grow your business because of the region and this sort of logistics constraint you have explained? For example, if you want to expand that, I think is your, what you are trying to do being here today, if you want to go bigger, how difficult will it be for you to continue the production in these kind of projects? So um, I'm not necessarily trying to go bigger. I'm just trying to go to the level of my production. So like I just, you know, in a pallet we have 720 bo bottles. I have maybe with this, with this one town, we can maybe produce, I think, 25,000 liters a year. Um, so I'm just trying to get to the level that where it's sustainable for them because um, I would say 30% of the agave um, that they work with, they buy from local um, magueyeros or lo local growers. Um, we have a big problem with Jalisco at the moment where a lot of um, people from Jalisco or brands are coming in and buying 90% of the agave that's being grown. So for me, there's that puts a lot of pressure on us to be in an economic position where we can buy local agave. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I mean, I'm not, uh, in interested in growing more than what's sustainable or what they actually have the capacity to produce at. So, you know, I'm, we don't, uh, uh, Erika and I were talking about this the other day, like, you know, with the way that we work, we're not like putting in an order for mezcal. I don't say like, I want an order of like 150 liters of Madre Quiche and uh, 200 liters of Biquiche and for, you know, it's like whatever plants are ripe, those are the ones that are ripe, they're distilled and so it may be, you know, my, I can't plan my productions um, in the same way that like, you know, other products can. Yeah, no, I can't. I mean, so everything, every batch, everything is always going to be different. Small is beautiful. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I think time's up. Uh, thank you, Nikki, for uh, uh, being with us. Uh, <laughs>
great. So it was great having you here, and thank you for this insight, deep insight to the, the scalp production in Miahuatlan. Um, we're gonna stop here. On va reprendre à 18h avec une conférence sur le mescal de Durango. Donc on fait une petite pause de 10 minutes. Merci beaucoup d'être venu.